It's another day's journey, and I'm so glad it's another day's journey, and I'm so glad it's another day's journey, and I'm so glad well the world can't do Ken Whiteley. No Bill Garrett, you're a, a major force on the Toronto music scene for over 30 years. You come up with an album that's got a really interesting cover, and I'll let you explain it. Well, the, the, the album's Another Day's Journey, and, I, and so I'm thinking about the journey, and I'm thinking that this album is a reflection of my journey in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do I reflect this journey that I've taken? And so the, I had the idea that, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a map? You know, like Lord of the Rings comes right. with a map, right. you know, and, and, and so on. So this is a good record. This is a good record that has a map. Right. You know, it's, it's to a scale. So there's elements of different cities that are in there, you know, mixed up. You know, one moment you're in Toronto and then you cross a street and all of a sudden you're in Hamilton. And right. you go this way and you're in Brooklyn and that way you're in Rochester, New York. And, right. Right. But all of these places reflect things that are in the album. We've got the Toronto Islands where Mariposa was for many years. But we, on Toronto Islands, we now have Tud Hope Park, which is the name of the park where Mariposa is once again up in Orillia. Right. You know, and then there's Innes Lake. And Innes Lake is where I first heard Joni Mitchell sing Urge for Going. And then we have Davis Bay, which is on Innes Lake, which is on the Sunshine Coast where Joni lives now. Right. You know, and this is all just north of the Lake of Stew. So anyway, right. yeah. so which is in Montreal. Which is in Montreal, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a musician, a producer, uh, you've been an artistic director, you've been a union, our union representative. Um, and uh, uh, before we get into some of the various roles in, in the new album, I really want to know, and I think probably a lot of people would like to know, what the first music you heard that really got to your heart and said, yeah, I want to pick up that guitar and I want to learn how to do this. My brother Chris and I, Mike, and, Chris, and I have the advantage of the fact that Chris is three years older than I, three right. years and six days. So I got a head start on a lot of things. So uh, we had uh, a little um, uh, Roy Rogers guitar. It had a wooden uh -huh. neck with actual metal frets, but a sort of a hard cardboard body. Uh -huh. uh, and we had that back when we lived in Kansas. Music was always kind of part of our lives. Right. My father's yeah. father, uh, he had been a band leader in Northern Ontario right. in the 1920s and 30s. And there's, uh, the, y if you go to my website, you can see a picture of the Whiteley Orchestra from 1929 or something like that. And my Uncle Eric on the, right. young dashing Uncle Eric uh, on the drums and, and my grandfather Frank Whiteley at the piano. And, oh, okay. and it looks almost like the original sloth band. You know, it's <laughs> sort of like there's a fiddle and a, and a saxophone and a tenor banjo. Right and the drums and piano. Right. And uh, so my dad always knew music. He sang in church choirs and stuff like that. And then my mother's father was, he also grew up in Northern Ontario. And he was born in the 1870s and came from a tradition where everyone was expected to have a song or a story at, at a, you know, at a social gathering right. or whatever. Right. You know, and he would, call on us to sing, you know, when we were like six, seven years yeah. old, that, right. uh, you know. They... In the early 60s, when there was the popularization of, of folk music and with groups like the Kingston Trio right. and, and Peter, Paul and Mary, my ears gravitated to that. Um, I'd, I'd already, um, you know, I already liked uh, some of the, the country music, the older country music, you know, uh, 16 Tons, I remember when that came out. And I remember hearing gospel groups, right. you know, I, I remember hearing uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego yeah. in the 50s and, you know, all these kinds of things, and they, they just stuck in my head. There was three children from the land of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, took a trip to the land of Babylon, Shadrach, my brother and I started making uh, weekly pilgrimages to Sam the Record Man. Mm -hmm. An English guy named John Norris actually ran the folk and blues section, and he later left to start his, he ran Coda Magazine. He was a great uh, jazz aficionado. But, but like a lot of the English guys, recognized the connection between jazz and blues and blues and folk music and saw it in, in that kind of continuum. And, I, and, I, and so that was a big influence on me because I've always seen it as, as part of a continuum. You know a bit of Certainly for me, there was a big turning point 
in the, the summer of 1964, uh, Mariposa Folk Festival, and, and I got to watch Reverend Gary Davis and Mississippi John Hurt meeting each other for the first time, and share, you know, and they were so excited to meet someone else who was a repository of the African American tradition, right. and to be sharing the, the songs, and you know, both great guitar players yeah, and. Right. And then that same Sunday afternoon, uh, Skip James, who was one of the real, he had this beautiful falsetto and this intensity. And he gave his first performance for a, sort of a white folky audience. He had, uh, Richard Waterman, a folklorist, had discovered him in a hospital bed 18 days before. And uh, Skip James, I remember seeing, this is his first performance and he's up there and he's saying, well, you know, a few weeks ago, I thought I was going to die, but this young young fellow over here, he said people want to hear me sing still. So here I am. I don't know if you'll like this, but here it is. And then, you know, he'd, I'd rather be the devil than be my woman's man. You know, and I'm, oh, wow. <laughs> and so in many ways, that that weekend formed the intention on my part. It was like, oh, wow, that's what I'd love to be, an old blues singer. You write music. S some of the music you write is is in those has some of those styles obvious uh, mm -hmm. that are obvious in them. Uh, but sometimes you, I hear you write just write a, a song that could be the guy from Don Mills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, you know when we began performing, it was it was in a jug band, and and our heroes were the Jim Queskin Jug Band. Mm -hmm. So the first group that we formed was a jug band, Tubby Fats Original All Star Downtown Syncopated Big Rock Jug Band. At the same time, I mean, we were I was also incredibly turned on by seeing Joni Mitchell and seeing the transformation of her from a sort of folk singer doing you know traditional material to writing her own songs. And then Chris and I also had this other life as, as songwriters, and in 1966 we got a tape recorder that allowed us to record sound on sound, and so we began making our own tapes, and that was really the start of the whole you know, fascination with recording. Uh, the new album, and it's a, it's a really good record, uh, and it brings back for me, at, at least, all of those, those uh, wonderful styles and feels that you have that you've done over the years. When I was making this album, there was a very conscious attempt to try and bring together some of these disparate uh, elements and make them into a kind of a cohesive whole. So, so I'm I'm bringing in you know there's a lot of my own material, a lot of songs that I've written, but I have it draws on those influences. So I consciously sort of wrote a jug band song, yeah. and a song in the style of the old classic jazzy blues singers from the 20s, you know, the women singers. And and, and then the, the inclusion of a Joni Mitchell song, but also kind of changing it up and doing it with as a slide guitar piece. And and so so it, it's incorporating a number of these kind of influences. And it's also was a kind of a reaching forward and a reaching out and a chance to kind of collaborate with a number of people who share some of my influences, right. exactly. and yet, uh, you know, seeing where we can take it forward. So the stuff with Kim and Reggie Harris, where Reggie and I wrote, you know, a few, a couple of songs together, or Guy Davis and I collaborated on some stuff, and and so these were drawing with, you know, with people with this not the same but similar backgrounds or complementary backgrounds and you know in blues and gospel and 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 creating something new that also reflects those roots that we, what we both share I, you know I'm constantly trying to refine this idea while there's still time while there's still all recordings that people are buying in a <laughs> physical form uh, explore this as a particular art form that where you where you create something that is diverse and interesting and has the variety and at the same time is of a piece you know, and it has things that are part of this evolving folk music community. Like a thing that's so interesting is the whole awareness of the sacred steel community. That um, sacred steel is this awesome, you know, gospel tradition that was totally under the radar for about 50 years. These people playing gospel steel guitar only in their own churches. And from the 50s when it sort of dropped off the map until the 90s. Right. And, you know, very exciting music and they've 
develop their own traditions and stuff like that. So I've had the chance in the last 10, 15 years to become friends with some of those people. So. And I know that you've, uh, over the years, you've worked with Kim and Reggie um, a bunch and, uh, and Guy Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you meet Marie Muldor? Well, I first met Maria you know, when she was would come to the riverboat on Yorkville Avenue in Toronto Quest with, with the Quesquin Jug Band. Right. And we would be down to see Quesquin. Like, he would come for a week or sometimes even two weeks. Right. And, you know, if he was there for, like, a, a week would be, like, five nights, Tuesday to Saturday. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and we'd be down there probably three of those five nights. In the 70s, late 70s and early 80s, when Maria was doing folk festivals, and all of a sudden we'd be on a gospel workshop together. And we've always maintained a, a, a friendship from that, and you know, it's been maintained over over a number of years. So, so I was writing these songs, and I was, and I was realizing that some of them were reflecting my background in the jug band stuff and things like that. And who better to get to sing a sort of a contemporary jug band song than the Marie Maldar? Yeah. Yeah. This has been a great conversation. Oh, hey, uh, we're not over yet, are we? <laughs>